When I was a kid, around three years old, all I wanted in my life was a puppy. Now, my parents didn't quite agree, and I didn't get a dog until I finally graduated from college and was out on my own. But now, with the benefit of hindsight, when I think back on why my parents, or any parents, may not want their kid to have a puppy, it kind of makes sense. Caring for a dog requires a lot of responsibility, more than many kids can handle. But if you're a parent, how do you convey that message in a way that your kid will understand? Parents, stick around. Hello, I'm James Jacobson. Welcome to The Long Leash, where we rescue tasty scraps from the editing room floor in an unscripted interview show. Today, we talk about One-Eyed Leo. He is the star of a book designed to teach children how the joy of a new puppy quickly turns into the cold reality of responsibility. Karen Walsh is probably the only author in the world who is happy that people don't like his book because there is a much bigger play at stake here. His book is called When Your Child Asks for a Dog and was created by a team of 50 contributing experts. He hopes his book will open eyes, change minds, and give children and parents alike a renewed appreciation for pet ownership. Stay tuned after this archive episode for an update on what Kieran has been up to since his book featuring One-Eyed Leo was published. Kieran Walsh, thank you so much for being with us today. James, it's a pleasure to be here. You are the author, the genius, if you will, behind One-Eyed Leo, which ostensibly, when you see it the first time, when I saw it the first time, oh, that's a cute kid's book, but it means so much more. Um, There's two things I'm going to correct very quickly, which is I am far from a genius (laughs) Um, And then secondly, I'm far from the author. There's been about 50 people working on this in one form or another. And that's only the contributors. And then there's a core team of six that I've worked with on other projects over the years. So, Kieran, what was the genesis of One-Eyed Leo? What's the backstory? The feeling I get from this book is that it was like a message that just turned up and had to find its way onto paper or into the digital world. And when I sort of look back over the last few months, it was like, it's sort of crazy how these things just fell into place and fell into place. And perhaps if I give you a simple idea, James, at the very beginning of it, and it sort of gives the essence and the nature of how these things just happened. And that's that's the only one going to say it happened, which was, I suppose about um, 18 months ago, I set up a different business and to really try and solve the problem. The problem that we're trying to solve is... Why are so many dogs abandoned to rescue shelters? And then if you're like, why can rescue shelters not cope? And then why is it next year and the year after and the year after that, the problem is a fairly consistent, why does it keep happening? And why do puppy mills and puppy farms take roughly a third of all the money in the pet dog industry? So this is something that's not very well known, but... um, I come from a financial background and basically I'm sort of very interested in where every cent goes and how it ends up there. You know, is it by will? Is it structural failure? Whatever. So it's something we touch on later. And I think a lot of your listeners will be surprised that in the States, the puppy mills and the puppy farms have a turnover of somewhere between four and seven billion dollars a year. Four and seven U.S. billion dollars. Yeah. Per year. Yeah. Now, basically, they, as I said, the core problem was how do we remove the market from the puppy mills? And if you can do that, you would change the nature of dog ownership and everything else. The earlier version of this project was to make dog training freely available to everybody by a Zoom system. And we discovered quickly enough there wasn't so much interest in that, surprisingly. And what it sort of came down to is a very strange conundrum, which is Most people will jump out and say, I really love my dog. Now, very few will actually respect their dogs, respect their pets. Now, when I say respect, I mean, go to the nth degree and how does this animal live? What's its natural way of thinking? 
what are its basic requirements. So when you start to ask those questions, it's, oh, you know, I love my dog, but I don't like all of this. You I know. like that distinction between loving your dog and respecting your dog. Yeah, it's a real tough one. It's a really tough one. So we um, looked at all the different angles in the equation and the way dogs end up in people's homes is is quite interesting. Like in the States, you know, you have a certain small percentage of dogs that are working dogs or professional dogs, show dogs, and then nearly all the others are domesticated dogs. That's sort of the better end of the world. In some countries, South America, it's 70% of all dogs are street dogs and only 30% are domesticated. So to stick with the domesticated dogs for the moment... They get adopted in two ways. There tends to be a category of persons, say, 60 years and older, who are living on their own, possibly for the first time. Their husband, their wife died. And they will get a companion animal and they'll take their time about it. So the dog will sort of fall into their life through a neighbor or they let the word out. They'll have a wider social circle. Now, the other 80 percent, this is where the fun starts. You've usually a parent or two parents and they've no intention of getting a dog. And then they have a child who is finished the kindergarten. So around the rough, roughly around the six year old marker. And at that age, it's a mixture. They go to the next school and parents meet parents at the school gates and come around to us for coffee or whatever. And the child goes around and they say, oh, oh mommy, daddy, look, they have a dog here. We have to have one of those. And then the parents have this horrible question. How do we handle the question? Now, this is the essence of one-eyed Leo to tick this moment. And it's this question is responsible for the four to seven billion of turnover. And I will, I'm, we're still on that track. So what basically happens is the conversation goes, we must have a dog. And if you don't get one, I'm discriminated. It's my human rights are violated. And the poor parents sort of now, the last time we had something like this was a bicycle. We got the credit card out, swipe. Christmas is coming, swipe. All of these things work. So why should a dog be any different? Mm -hmm. And then you look at the category of the families that end up with the dog, and it falls into three basic categories. You have um, roughly 50% of dogs come from rescue shelters or friends somewhere close. Then commercial breeders. Now, this is really a professional class, and it's not so much you have two parents and a child, but these would be purebreds, dogs with lineage, and they will take up 15% of the market. Then there's 35% of the market unfilled. And this is where the puppy mills and the online merchants come in. So if the parent's quite happy to take out the credit card, and it can be anything from $500 to, say, in New York, I think it's about 3500 for a very similar dog. So I'm beginning to wonder if they've got just a better class of dog or puppy mill or just New York happens to be more expensive. <laughs> Supply and demand. Supply and demand. And the whole question is, how do we take this market away from the puppy mills? Now, there's been legislation and the lawmakers have tried for years and years. And the difficulty with the legal system is you tend to tweak a market and then retweak it and retweak it. And it takes some very brave legislation to actually outlaw a market. It can be a dangerous thing because quite often you get the law of unintended consequences and you might have an even worse situation if the legislation isn't 100% foolproof. Mm -hmm. So the entire puppy mill industry depends on this ill-informed decision mm -hmm. of the six to 10-year-old demanding that that market take up of 35% be filled. So the reasons behind the book are, are quite complex. How did you go about creating the book for children as well as their parents while getting the message across? The kernel of the book is how do we produce an educational system and a foolproof system to remove that market? And what One Eyed Leo is all about is going at the six to 10 year old children with a love story. And the love story is basically a one-eyed disabled dog in a rescue shelter. And you've two, you have a six and a 10 year old child and they fall in love with Leo, the one-eyed Leo. Now, normally people would say, oh, that dog looks nice. I think we'll bring it home. That's Game of Thrones again. But in this particular book, everything is anti-clockwise. So the book is all about Leo saying, oh, if you want to take me home, these are my terms and conditions. And in every chapter, it's the sort of the love story between the two, how they bring the dog home for the first time. And then Leo says, well, I need three days of silence. And then I need three weeks to sort of see what's going on. And then I need three months to see 
what's happening in the neighbourhood. And at every step, the children sort of learn how a dog thinks or what we should get used to. And the book sort of has a, a subtle text, which is the adults don't have to make a decision for the child. The child makes it for themselves. And if the child decides after four or five chapters that this sounds a bit too much like work and this thing, respect sounds like a word that comes in here, and the children say, well, maybe not yet. Could we leave it? Now, that for the parents would be a major success because there's no emotional challenge. There's no emotional baggage. The question hasn't even been answered. The children have researched it. Now, on the other hand, if the children say, actually, we like this research, we like the responsibility, then they go on to chapters up to, I think it's 15 or 6. It's a book, is about 38 pages. And at every step, it's like a university education and resource management. So it goes through, well, what do we do if the dog poos in the house? Why is punishment useless? What's the diet about? Oh, we have to keep away from the dog when it's eating. There's a danger of a bite. So that's on one side of the page. And the beauty of the book is embodied by a famous artist called Oksana Weber, who has exhibitions somewhere in the world at any time. And when I say this book is explosive, again, I'm, and we're going to get back to this in a moment about how the book wrote itself, Oksana documented planet Earth's most famous explosion, which was for 10 years after Chernobyl blew up. Hmm. She was commissioned by the local government to paint the landscape and document the landscape over a 10-year period. Hmm. And her work is abstract, but for this, she's basically done sketches and you can feel the life of the one-eyed Leo coming to life at every page. So whoever gets this, it really is um, a work of art as well as a love story. All of that is mostly on the left page of the book. So on the right page, you have a narrative for the adults to read to the children. Mm -hmm. And this is where we sort of expand on what the love story is. And we go into, well, how the details of the love story turn into cold reality of responsibility. And it builds up step by step by step. So at the end, and as chapters go by, we have a situation where the children subtly learn to make agreements between themselves, then between themselves and the dog or between themselves and animals, between themselves and parents, because the schedules have to be worked out, between themselves and even the local rescue shelter, the vets, dog trainers, and society in general. So what's sort of curious about this book is it's probably the first child's book in the world where if the children opt out by chapter four or five, it's considered a major success. Now, if they continue on to the end of the book, the parents have this enormous investment because a day will come when your son or your daughter will say to you, um, I'm bringing my boyfriend home for lunch. Is that OK? I'm bringing him home for tea. And then the parents can say, well, as long as you have been as fussy and as careful and he has ticked all the boxes in one night, Leo, 12 years ago, there will be absolutely no problem at all. <laughs> That's perfect. A book that is successful when it isn't finished. We're going to take a quick break right here. But when we come back, we will hear about the moment that the real one-eyed Leo came into his life and the time that this newly minted author lived in a cave. We'll be right back. And now, a message from your dog. Every day with you is like a day at the beach, and I want as many beach days as possible. I want to run and sniff and find a good stick to carry. I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want ever pup. It infuses any food you give me with health and life and vibrancy. I can feel it. It's a strange thing to do, sprinkle this powder on my food, but I wouldn't have it any other way. My time with you is precious and irreplaceable, and I'm thrilled to be with you for as long as possible. Here's to puppy playtime and senior snoozes. <laughs> no matter how old I get, I want my ever pup. It just makes me feel good. In this life, and the next, and the next, and the next, I am so grateful to be your dog and for the ever pup you give me. 
So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. But to get the best price possible, join the Everpup Club at everpupclub.com, where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Everpup every day. Welcome back. Now, Kieran, you've spoken about how this book was a huge team effort, including how you got the international artist Ochana Verba, who illustrates the book, involved. How did you guys meet? Well, Oxana is sort of like everything else in the book, purely by accident. I wrote to, I think, about 15, 20 sketch artists on LinkedIn looking for somebody that could do this. And I said, well, I'm going to jump back one step, which is quite important, where I was working with a very famous um, neighbour of mine in Ireland, and she used to present dog programmes for the BBC, and she's an author of, of dog books, and she's been a close friend and an advisor for God knows how many years. And we were trying to get the first draft of the book and the concept, and we got to this point where should it be situation driven or should we have a central character to drive it? And we had that conversation and we couldn't make up our mind. And now I was having this conversation when I was coming back from the supermarket with, with two um, cardboard boxes of groceries. And I left the cardboard boxes outside the door and I was staying in a cave at the time up in the mountains. So it's a good place for quietness to see what would happen. So anyway, we were having this conversation and I went out. You know I'm going to ask you about that, right? We're not just going to let that one go. Oh, we, we were. Okay, keep going. Right? You, you put the groceries, you were going back to your cave. Yeah, yeah, I took the groceries out, left the cardboard boxes outside the cave. I had this conversation with Eileen. Should it be driven by situations or a character? And, you know, would it be one of the children? Would it be whatever? And just as we were talking, this terrier with one eye walks up to me looks at the cardboard boxes and decides to sit in the cardboard boxes and looks at me as if to say, is it okay if I stay here with you now for the next few months? And I thought, I just said to Eileen, I think our character has arrived. <laughs> <laughs> and it was as simple as that. And that is the essence of the entire book. Everything happens just like that. And it's like, I just feel I'm sort of, if you like, I'm a passenger on a train. I've no idea where it comes and people get on board and I just say, where would you like to sit? And then they say, I'll sit over here. It's, oh, yes, that's lovely. So the view from the window on the left hand side looks like this, which is the left side of the book. And then somebody else comes in and they tell me, what's the view on the right side, which is the narrative? And it looks like this. I love it. And then, you know, sometime later, a very lovely woman, probably known to all your listeners, Deborah Hamilton who's a lawyer and an animal rights activist. And she'd be sort of at the back of the train saying, well, the backup and the legal positions should be like this. I thought, yeah, that's great. That, that works as well. So I've never written a book before. And this is more a case. I've never planned to write this one. The original idea was to write sort of a series of contracts between dogs and owners. So I'd say what's crazy about this book is I sort, I'm sort of always wondering every day, well, what's going to happen next? So I'm going to get answer your question 20 minutes ago. How did I meet Oksana? Yeah. <laughs> right. You will love okay. this. Yes. How did you guys meet? Right. I was just doing a little bit of hiking one day and somebody mentioned she was an artist. They mentioned this at the end of the hike and I said, we'll have to meet up someday. And I completely forgot about the book. So the next day I met her at a, a sort of a social event for the hiking group and she was um, sketching her son. Her son was was over and I was just looking at this and I said, that's not a sketch. That's a photograph. You know, talk, this is wow. So I said to her, you know, could you sketch a dog if you saw one? And she asked me about 20 questions. Well, what does the dog look like? I said, oh, it's a terrier and it's this size. And she said, well, you know, when it looks at you, so what do you feel? And she said, OK, what's the human expression? So she went through 20 questions and she said, I'll send you something in the morning. Now, I didn't have a photograph of Leo at all or anything. And next morning, I get three sketches on my phone and the WhatsApp, and I nearly had a heart attack. So I showed these to some people beside the cave, and they said, oh, when was she here? Just from the conversation, she got the complete essence of the dog. Mm. 
Okay, let's do the cave thing because, again, we can't let that one go. You were living in a cave? Yes. Where, why, how long, what is it? Well, it's basically when they let people out of Ireland in the um, in the COVID lockdown. Mm-hmm. It was sort of like first plane out, I need the sunshine quick because I, I do have problems with vitamin D. It's In Ireland, we're in the lower hemisphere, so we don't get any sunshine for six months of the year. Well, we get sunshine, but we can't get vitamin D from it. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's quite problematic. So I'd be one of... The millions that would depend on synthetic vitamin D, and sometimes that doesn't work. So I came as quickly as I could to the canaries. Now, the canaries have nothing to do with the canary bird. It's actually canis, as in dog or wolf. The islands of the dog. Islands of the dogs, yeah. That's great. Yeah. So the cave is on an Airbnb, and I thought, that's fine. And it was um, in a sort of a vegan farm which I thought was absolutely excellent. It goes along with my lifestyle. And I have a major confession, which is they do have as a sort of the mission statement that it's strictly a vegan farm and no meat and no alcohol, no drugs. Absolutely fine with all that. I will confess I did smuggle in minced beef to Leo for most of my stay there. Mm-hmm. So I would say we became very good friends and we were the best of dinner mates. <laughs> I imagine he was very happy. And as we know, mm-hmm. dogs are not vegan and they should not be fed for vegetarian only diets. Wow. So it really sounds like the hand of fate has been guiding this throughout, which is not an uncommon theme among people who come on this show and come on Dog Podcast Network because dog lovers are sort of being moved in this way to make the world a better place for for dogs. And sometimes it works in these mysterious ways. What kind of results have you seen from the book already? When was it officially published? Um, We are talking only a couple of weeks ago, it's been let out to the world. But my way of looking at any business is you have to test, 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 test. And quite simply, if you let something onto the market, and then you have to go and correct it, then the costs go through the roof. And the entire project can be in jeopardy. So Mm -hmm. we've had a lot of focus groups and one of them, which has been an absolute godsend, is a lovely group called Rebound Dogs. If your listeners look it up, you'll be quite amazed. And this is basically a collection of people from the pet dog industry. So it can be animal psychologists, vets, people working in pet food industry, you name it. They seem to all gravitate towards this forum. And it's run by a good friend of mine, Spencer Hodgetts. Is it an international focus? or? Oh, it is. It is very much so. It's really about addressing the imbalances that I mentioned earlier. We'll put a link to Rebound Dogs in the show notes for this episode. Lovely. So the Rebound Dogs seems to have the best of dog authors and canine experts. And every so often, I would send the book to everybody and say, does anybody have any comments? And then Someone would say, well, you need this chapter or you need this chapter and this word needs to be changed. And I would say, you know, I've never written a book before. I am a professional dog trainer, but nowhere with the experience of some of these people who have been have maybe 30, 40, 50 years experience. And we've some of them are best selling authors of dog books as well in that group. So it was um, absolutely lovely to see this happening by itself. And. Then when the final work, we have 22 different versions of it. In other words, the 22nd draft. So when that finally ended, the testimonials coming back from everybody have been outstanding. Like, you know, the veterinary industry say this has to be rolled out as quickly as possible. We have other people saying, and this is just from the best sellers saying this is the best dog book they have ever seen. So... It can be slightly difficult to be modest when you see that. So I won't mention the other 16 testimonials. But, you know, I'm just the the fellow who put the words in after people sent them in, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's really the the story of it and where it's at. And what do you look to the future? Where do you think this is going to go? Is this going to be a movie or a show or something to reach a larger audience than a children's book? Um, I I have no idea. And to be quite honest, the primary goal of this is that when people buy it, certain families won't decide to get a dog. That was always the core aim. Anything better than that is a plus. 
We're getting a lot of support by the day. We're getting a lot of companies and organizations insisting that it be translated. I think it's in three or four languages at the moment, and we have requests from veterinary organizations for another six or seven. We'll be going down the crowdfunding Kickstarter route on the 13th of October, which is about five or six or seven weeks away. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing we're looking at is going to try and find art galleries wherever we have a local agent. And the idea is that Oksana's work would be the exhibition, but then we'd have sort of storytelling days to maybe children. And we try and get um, like local dog trainers, rescue shelters, veterinary companies in there. And I'm talking to a few of the animal pharmaceutical companies to, what's the word, underwrite a certain... Write a check. Is, 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 is that the word, right? <laughs> to write a check. Write a check. To underwrite the efforts to support the dog-loving community. And you've already gotten some financial support from some interesting organizations. We have, well, my, my local authority, that's Cavan Enterprise Group, put quite a lot of effort into it. They have a lovely system in Ireland where if you think you have a good idea for a business, they set up an interview with what's called an enterprise officer and they could go through, well, what's the business plan and all that. Now, if you go in and you say, I haven't a clue of a business plan, there's absolutely no problem. They sit down with you over a cup of coffee and they just, you talk, they write, and then you suddenly have a business plan. And then the next thing they will do is underwrite the cost of an expert in the industry to take a look at it. And then if they feel that's good enough, they'll say, well, we'll back 80% of the costs to a prototype or something like that. So that all happened. And then I got some support from Enterprise Ireland, which is the national organization where they would look at the possibility of bringing this globally. And then the next thing, we got some financial support from Social Entrepreneurs Ireland, which was, um, it was basically one of the top 15 social projects chosen that could change a social phenomenon or social problem in Ireland. So people would have, for example, ideas that would change migrant integration into Irish society or the housing problem. And the idea with this is it might impact on the number of abandoned dogs in Ireland. So that was sort of the original plan. And then suddenly it sort of ended up like it's really going to be a, a US phenomenon before before it gets anywhere in Ireland, I think. Just the welcome it's received from actors in the States has just been mind-boggling. Who are some of the actors who have gotten behind what you're doing here? Well, I think I've mentioned one already, which is Debbie Hamilton, and she's, she's my gosh, at every step. like She's, she's been a fabulous mentor and a friend, um, going through it word by word. Then there's the um, dog trainer, Billy Groom, who is also... Um, and the American Dog Writers Association, I think. What I'm really curious about is what kind of feedback have you gotten from your core demographic, those six to 10 year olds? What have you heard? Right. That has been consistent at between three and four out of 10 hitting the target, which is no, it's a lovely book, but we don't want to read it yet or we don't want a dog yet. Success. You know, so that's that <laughs> sounds terrible. You know, you don't like my book. I'm so happy. You know? <laughs> Uh huh. That is definitely it. You don't hear authors say that a lot. That's awesome. Yeah, James, I did say it's a bit crazy. You know? but I suppose that could be the standard for a first book. You know, I'm so happy people don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> but usually there's not as much of a rationale. This is purposely designed for you to not to like, or at least to weed you out. It's, yeah. it's really the ultimate marketing funnel. Again, to go back to like the selling of this concept that if it is accepted by the children will have an influence on the family and you know in a very significant way reduce the number of dogs and that are unwanted and puppy milled and kind of put a jab into the to that industry it is very very clever but you must have gotten some you know memorable notes or communications from kids what they say we have a few which was uh, it's not too surprising but Everybody has fallen in love with Leo. It's sort of weird, you know, he, there's something about Oksana. It's just, wow. It's like, I don't like to say this, but sort of the, an original Mickey Mouse image or uh, I was never one for Ninja Turtles, but it's sort of the panda or something like that. The other, I suppose the other things that surprised me from the children is one with the going to the toilet in the house. 
And that was sort of the chapter where we got a lot of reactions, which children didn't understand that dogs don't understand punishment. That was the one that sort that the one feedback that came back most frequently. And I think that not just the children, but families as well, that they said, oh, we always just give the dog a quick hit on the face if there was an accident. Nobody shows them where the toilet in the house is. And then the outside world is locked away from them. So the book really tries to get this idea of a different universe through the dog's eyes and how Leo would like to set up the terms and conditions. James, one last comment, if I may. Sure. There is a chapter in this book and... It's sort of also the essence of the book. It's not just bringing the dog into your life, but there's a special chapter on when the dog leaves your life. And it's basically the day of the Rainbow Bridge. And it's when the dog leaves your life. And we go to a lot of work to prepare the child for that moment through both the love story and the narrative. So for €12.50 from Dog Internet of Things, One-Eyed Leo, this isn't an investment just for the dog's life, your child's life but for all of the family's life. You packed a lot into 38 pages, you and your illustrator and a team behind you. Kieran Walsh, thank you so much for telling us about One-Eyed Leo. James, thank you so much for having me. Now, we spoke with Kieran recently to see what's been up since the book was first debuted, and we have some ways that you can participate in new research he's doing. First, Kieran and his team at The Dog Internet Company, what a name, The Dog Internet Company, were accepted by an EU British Educational Supply Association with a funded enterprise accelerator program. Their goal is to have, when your child asks for a dog, approved as a standard school book in the curriculum. This is where you can come in. They are presently seeking families, whether you already have a dog or if you're thinking about getting one, they're seeking them out to participate in a research project. They need volunteers to read a virtual download of the book with their kids and then complete a survey. If you're interested and like to try, you can reach out to Kieran via his email. We have the link in today's show notes. Finally, Kieran and his team are in the final weeks of producing an online course, which is the basics of dog welfare. This is specifically designed for commercial breeders and SPCA rescue organizations. Well, that is all we have time for today. I want to thank you for taking me along with you on your walk or your ride or just tuning in today. And I want to encourage you, if you don't already, please subscribe to The Long Leash in your favorite podcast app. You can also find us on YouTube. If you'd like to learn more about other shows that Dog Podcast Network produces for dog lovers, please visit our website at dogpodcastnetwork.com. Thank you again for joining us on The Long Leash. I'm James Jacobson. On behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'd like to wish you and your dog a very warm aloha.